here's a way to structure it. Um, and that would be where you would ask that you would work with the child to write down the thought that they have, the degree to which they believe it, the evidence for it, the evidence against it, and then the new thought and the way that they believe it. Um, Beck refers to this as the two column technique. And so um, in Beck's cognitive therapy for depression, they use this strategy a lot. And again, it's pretty logical, pretty <laughs> rational, and so people um, tend to get it. Okay, another strategy is called alternative interpretation. And um, again, it's based on that idea that we construct our interpretations and that there are multiple interpretations. So um, if you think about the group, the groups that we ran, and you think about a, seventh, um, a group of seventh grade girls, what would you guess would be the um, most common negative thought and situation that reflected that thought that we came across? Another track. Okay, so that was that one. Somebody doesn't like them. That's it. Somebody doesn't like them. It's those two. And uh, um, when I'm listening to the tapes, the number of times that those come up is just astronomical. You know, it's on a regular basis. So um, the one about appearance is a little harder to work with. And the one about um, somebody doesn't like me is a little bit easier. So let's take the someone and he doesn't like me, all right? So the girl comes to the group and she says, um, my best friend hates me. OK? So how do you know that your best friend hates me? She didn't talk to me in the halls. I passed her. She didn't say hi to me. She hates me, all right? So what are the alternative interpretations? Why else might her um, best friend not have said hi to her as they passed through the hall? They didn't see her. They didn't see her. They're in a hurry. They're in a hurry. Late to class, thinking about class, they're rushing to class. They're having a bad day. Having a bad day. Mm -hmm. Other things on their mind. Uh-huh. Other things on their mind. What else? They were thinking that that person was upset with them, so they didn't say. Uh, that's a possibility. <laughs> okay. So um, usually you can generate a pretty good list of alternatives. So you can choose to hold on to the belief that she hates you, and then you'll go around the rest of the day avoiding her and being mean to her. or you would choose to believe that she was in a hurry and she had other things on her mind and she didn't really see you. So then you would feel better and what would you be more likely to do? Hmm? Talk to the best friend. Yeah, talk to her and find out what's going on. And so if it turned out that your best friend actually was upset with you, then what strategy could you use? Problem solving to figure out how to um, take care of that problem. And if, while you were um, talking with your best friend, you started to get pretty upset, or after the conversation you felt pretty upset, then what would you do? Use coping. There you go. So it's a nice example of how to use coping, problem solving, and cognitive restructuring all for the same situation. Okay? All right. So um, it helps to open up their thinking. And again, it's that same idea of you try to identify the maladaptive thought, you obtain a mood rating, um, you come up with the alternatives, you choose an alternative, obtain a new mood rating, gauge the believability of it, and then um, the child tries out the new thought. Okay? Right. Kids get this one too. 
it does, it, they seem to learn it um, relatively easily. It takes a number of meetings, but they do tend to get it. And here's an example of um, a homework sheet that they can use to um, help structure use of that cognitive restructuring strategy. What if? Um, there's two interpretations of this strategy. Um, one interpretation is that you talk with the person about what if that really did happen? Would it be as horrible as you think? And then there's another interpretation of um, this strategy and it's um, where you ask the person um, what would be the worst thing that could happen, what could be the best thing that could happen, and what's the most realistic. They're pretty similar, just a little bit different. And um, I find that this strategy works a lot better with anxious kids. It, it really works well with anxious kids. Um, many years ago, I had a real bright, anxious kid that I was working with. Well, he was depressed and anxious. And um, I said to him, he said to me, um, well, I'm going to fail that test. And um, the kid was extremely bright, ended up being a National Merit Scholar. He wasn't going to fail any test. There wasn't anything in high school that they could present to him that he was going to fail. And um, nevertheless, I said to him, okay, so what would happen if you um, failed the test? And he said, well, if I failed the test, then I'd probably give up in school. If I gave up in school, I'd probably fail a bunch of tests. I'd end up dropping out. I'd be on the drag pushing a shopping cart looking for, tin, for aluminum cans. <laughs> and after he said it, he kind of looked at, whoa. I go from, I might fail a test, to I'm on the streets, homeless, pushing a shopping cart. And he could see that his catastrophic thinking was pretty unrealistic. And so it was relatively easy to restructure it. But that um, stemmed from that question of, what if it happened? And so for the anxious kids, what if you touch, or the OCD kids, what if, what if you did touch that doorknob without it, washing your hands? What's going to happen? Um, or for the socially anxious kids, what, what if you talked to the girl at the locker next to you? What might happen? Okay, And so you, you talk about their expectation. And then the alternative is, so. Um, what would be the worst thing that could happen if you talked to that girl? All right, so what would it be? She wouldn't talk back. How many times have you experienced people not being nice to you? A whole bunch of times. You'd cut it, you'd end up just withdrawing from that situation, be a little bit upset, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. Okay, what would be the best thing that could happen? What would it be? Uh huh. And what's the most realistic? Probably that you talk to her. Because, you know, there's a strong pull if you talk to someone for them to talk with you. So probably she'd talk with her. Okay, so that's the what if strategy. And then um, what would I tell my best friend? So um, one of the times that I can think of that recently where I used that strategy, um, one of the kids said um, to, that um, she said, I'm really stupid. I'm never going to end up um, making it through high school, and um, I'll never get into a good college. I'm just so stupid. Okay, so what happened that led you to think um, 
you're really stupid. And it was, I got a 62 on my, bio, my AP bio, biology test. So what's AP? It's a Texas thing. I don't know if it's across the country. Yeah, it's advanced placement. So, so if you're in the class, it's, you got to be pretty bright. But anyway, so I got a 62 on my AP test. I'm really stupid. OK, so tell me more about the test. How did everybody else in the class do? Well, there's one kid who got a 71, but most of the kids failed the test. Oh, so you got a 63 or 2, whatever I said, 62. And basically, everybody did poorly on it. So I could do alternative interpretation. Um, or um, if she's really stuck in, um, I must be stupid, then I could say to her, so I thought in your AP biology class, you had one of your best friends in that class. Yeah. So if your best friend said to you, I got a 62 on the test, I am really stupid. I'm never going to pass this class. I'm never going to get into college. What would you tell her? So what do you think she said? Just one test. Okay. Everybody failed. Everybody failed. It's not you. Uh-huh. And what else? Because Exactly. Said all of those things. And so after she says all of those adaptive, healthy ways of thinking, you would say to her, um, wouldn't it be nice if you thought those same things for yourself? And if you did, how would you feel? Feel a lot better. So um, wouldn't it be nice if you thought in this kind of best friend way for yourself if you were your own best friend and you thought that way? then you'd end up feeling a lot better, OK? So um, oftentimes, the kids have the healthy thought when it applies to somebody else. And so you want them to see that, and then you want them to apply it to themselves. And usually, they get it. They get that. They're kind of a little bit stunned. OK, this, does, this is kind of silly that I don't do this for myself. OK, here's a cognitive restructuring um, worksheet that helps them to use those strategies. So um, write down the thought and how much they believe it. And then they can choose which of these questions they're going to ask themselves. What would I tell my friend? What are the clues? So what's the evidence? What's a different way to look at it? And what if it happens? And then they um, write it down. And then they um, write down how much they believe that thought now. OK. There's another, um, oh, go ahead. Okay. Let's say that someone said that and they really don't do well in school. They're really low academic, uh -huh. form low academically. Uh -huh. And they feel bad about that. Yes. Great question. So. If you um, perform poorly in school and um, you're really not that good in academics, then you might feel badly. And so one of the strategies you would use is coping, coping and problem solving. So maybe you'd get a tutor and you get some other supports to help you do better in school. So that would be one way to solve the problem. The other way to solve the problem is um, to look at what is the meaning of doing poorly in school or not doing as well as you'd like in school. So what do you think might be that child's um, meaning for the self about not performing well in school? I'm worthless. OK. Or maybe um, Karen gave us some of these kind of if-then kind of things. Okay. If I do poorly in school, 
then my grandma and aunt will hate me. I'm worthless. I'm unlovable. You know, so you want to get at what's the underlying meaning for the child of that situation. What makes it so upsetting? So um, let's say that you are, um, well, how many of you know kids who did poorly in school and were very happy? Everybody does, right? So well, how can you do poorly in school and still be happy? <laughs> okay. So what's, okay. So the, so you look at the other strengths that you have, and you say, OK, so maybe I'm never going to be the greatest student, but that's OK, because I'm a person that's really likable, or I'm really good at um, playing an instrument, or I'm a great actor, or I'm really good at a sport, or whatever it is. And so you help them to see that they still have value, and they're still um, uh, likable despite that. Okay, so that's what you just work out. Instead of that meaning of I'm worthless and I'm unlovable because I'm not so good at um, schoolwork. Okay, and uh, again, great question, and so feel free to ask questions as we go along here. Um, behavioral experiments. So um, the most powerful way to change a thought is through a behavioral experiment. So I had a um, girl that I was working with, teenager who had agoraphobia. And her belief was, if I go outside, there are dangerous people out there, and we might get hurt. Or I might get hurt, she said. And so I said to her, well, you know, if I go along with you and we go outside, what's going to happen? And she said, yeah, we, could have, we could end up getting hurt. You never know who's out there. There's some bad people around. I said, OK. And it looks like a pretty safe neighborhood to me, and I think we can test it out. What else might happen? Well, if we cross the street, the car's not going to stop at the red light, and it's going to hit us. Well, you know, I think we're both old enough that we can stand on the sidewalk, we can look and see if there's cars coming, and I bet we'll be safe. So your fear is if we go outside, you're gonna, we're going to end up getting hurt. And the evidence would be we'd get run over, we'd get mugged, something horrible like that would happen. What would happen if we, what would it mean if we went outside, we walked for two or three blocks, we crossed the main road, turned around, walked back, and we didn't get hurt, we didn't see any thugs, no cars chased us around and ran us over, and we came back safe. How would that fit with that idea that it's an unsafe, everything's unsafe? Okay? So we went out and did it. And that was a pretty good way of showing her, because what did she do in her typical way of life? She stayed home. Remember, she's agoraphobic. So she didn't go out. She avoided contact with the external world. So she had no evidence that maybe the world's really a safe place. And she would just go from the door of her house into the car, the car to my office, get out, um, parents would let her out um, a few feet from the entrance to the office, and then one of them would accompany her upstairs, and she'd come into my room. So everything was structured around her fear that the world's a dangerous place. So um, you, we set up a series of, we could call them behavioral experiments. What else could you call them? Exposures. Uh huh. It's a very direct way of testing out her belief and showing her that um, it wasn't true. And so we would do these experiments, these exposures, and we went from walking around the office building to going to um, less threatening 
um, other public places to more and more threatening public places in more kind of dangerous neighborhoods. So um, behavior, that's behavioral experiments. They're a little harder to think of, and um, you have to really be thinking on your feet to come up with good behavioral experiments, other than I think with anxiety where it's easy because we all think of the exposures. Um, but um, they're really powerful, and they're the most powerful way to change thinking. How long did it take her to be able to go out on her own? It took a lot of, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of exposures and behavioral um, experiments, so to speak, to get her to the point where she could go out on her own. The other nice thing was oh, well, she also had social anxiety disorder, so that made it really hard for her because she didn't have other kids who asked her to do things. Well, they would, but she wouldn't do them. Um, so she had a couple friends that were long-term friends, and they really assisted. And they got her anxiety. They understood it, and they got the idea that she was comfortable with doing certain things but not others, and they helped her move to doing more and more threatening things, but they were with her, and they did it as a group, and she felt safer and was more willing to take the risk. So between what we were doing, what her friends naturally knew to do, they're pretty good kids, and what her parents helped her with because they did a lot of exposures too, um, she worked through it. But like um, a lot of serious anxiety disorders, it took a long time. It probably took, I bet, a year and a half of exposures. That's really behavioristic psychology itself. Uh-huh. Right. So it's a very behavioral approach. But cognitive behavior therapy subsumes behavior therapy. And um, what we would view as the change agent is that we're changing the person's way of thinking and their beliefs as a result of doing the behavioral things. Okay, how are we doing for time, Tuma? We have about 25 minutes until our time. Okay. All right, so we'll think through how we're going to proceed. Um, self disclosure. Um, self disclosure is when you end up just disclosing your own thoughts in, um, that you would have if you were in that situation. And you're modeling, essentially, um, a different way of thinking about it. And um, so that's a, I don't know, just a longer way of saying, essentially, what you're doing is you're modeling your own thoughts that are um, more adaptive for the child, and you ask them how they would think if they um, thought that way. Okay, so we're going to do that um, in a few minutes, and then the muck monster. Okay, so um, the muck monster activity is um, really a lot of fun, and I think it's a really powerful way to restructure the kids' thinking. Okay, so um, you know, based on March's approach and his idea of externalizing your um, anxiety or your depression, your negative way of thinking, to something outside of you, we came up with this idea of the muck monster, that that's what you would externalize it to. And the really um, fun thing was we asked the girls to draw their muck monster. And all of them had an image of what the muck monster would look like. So they got out some pretty um, large sheets of construction paper and they drew their muck monsters. Okay? So the therapists in the first 10 sessions are keeping track of the negative thoughts of each of the kids. Okay? And so they have that written out. And um, the kids now have their muck monsters. And so if we were to just pretend that this was one of their muck monsters, you'd end up putting the muck monster 
in the empty chair. Okay? And then you'd have um, the, one of the girls in the group sit in the other chair. Okay? So, and then the therapist would um, be sitting in a third chair. Okay, so initially, you pass the list of negative thoughts to the, d the girl um, that's depressed, and she verbalizes the muck monster thoughts. And as she's verbalizing the thoughts, the therapist is act actively disputing those thoughts. Okay, so the kids would call it arguing with the muck monster. And we would teach them more effective strategies for winning the argument, which was the cognitive restructuring strategies. So initially, the therapist um, is arguing with the muck monster and disputing the negative thoughts. And then um, you get a mood rating before it, and then a mood rating after that. Okay? Now we switch. And the therapist becomes the voice for the muck monster. And the girl has to argue against the muck monster. So she has to use the cognitive restructuring strategies to change um, what the muck monster is saying. OK? Can you picture it? Yeah? No? OK. So if you have a group of kids, how, do, how does it work? It works really well. Because um, when the girl is arguing against the muck monster, they're all giving her additional things that she can say and questions she can ask to beat the muck monster. Then the other thing that I was surprised at was when the girl was being the voice of the muck monster, um, the other girls would give her really provocative thoughts. Way more, um, they would take it way harder than the therapists were willing to do. But um, the girls that were the voice of the muck monster um, were not getting upset. They were just, you know, taking it and adding it in. And it was like the girls really um, knew what the person was really thinking and were able to verbalize it. And so they were able to even create a more intense way and a better way of restructuring. So the strategy worked really, really well, both when the um, girl was her own voice of her own muck monster and when she was arguing against the muck monster doing the restructuring. So um, in a nutshell, that's how you do um, we would do the muck monster activity. What's that kind of, that's similar to what therapeutic strategy? Yeah, the empty, empty chair strategy. So it's just a, a kind of a similar a spin off of that strategy. Okay, so we're down to about 10 minutes. Down to about, uh, a little bit more than that. Okay, so what questions do you have about? Um, cognitive restructuring and the different strategies so far. And then after we do that, we'll take a break for lunch. And then we'll come back and we'll either use Karen again or we'll get someone else to volunteer. And we'll see how many different um, cognitive restructuring strategies I can squeeze into the role play. And um, then after we do that, we'll um, break no, we won't break. We'll um, have you all just try it out with each other and see what kind of questions you have and how it goes and all of that, OK? I know, everybody always kind of hates that when they have to do it, but it's a good strategy for learning. So we'll do that. Um, if I wanted to be really awful, I'd say, OK, and then two of you are going to have to come up here and model it for everybody. But we're not going to do that. That's too much pressure. Um, okay, so any questions so far? Or no? All right. So um, if you are, if you, um, if we review before the break, so 
um, there, first we're going to set the stage for the cognitive restructuring by educating the kids about cognition. Our goal is going to be to get them to understand that just because they think it doesn't mean it's true, that they construct their way of thinking. Then we're going to, um, throughout therapy, do some restructuring, but um, we're now going to start to teach them how to do it for themselves. Two main approaches, one is the what Beck calls the inelegant, which is more of the self-instructional training, which is just giving them alternative coping thoughts. And then there's the more elegant way of doing it, where you catch the negative thoughts, and you evaluate their validity, and then change those thoughts. And there's a variety of strategies. There's what's the evidence, alternative interpretation, what if, what would I tell my best friend? And cognitive modeling. And then there's the behavioral strategy of behavioral experiments. And our objective is to um, eventually have the girls learn how, or the kids learn how to do that for themselves and to change their core beliefs. And we know that there's those three core beliefs, and so we're going to always be watching for evidence that's going to help us with those. Okay? Too much? Can I go over the self-mapping? Yeah, we'll do that after break, too. Okay, so um, get back for lunch. We'll role play, demonstrate, try it out, and then we'll move on from there. And um, so normally, I would be doing some preparation before the meeting and some thinking, you know, ahead of time. And um, I didn't really do that over lunch. So um, from the two role plays that we've done so far, there are um, a few beliefs that we've identified. One is um, that she sees herself as helpless. Another is that she sees herself as worthless or invisible. Uh, she sees herself as unlovable and not normal. Okay, are there other beliefs or thoughts that you all can remember that she has um, expressed so far that I need to think about hitting? Anyone think of any others? What about Karen? Do you think? Of, can you think of any others? So we're talking really broadly. Mm -hmm. so I'm trying to think of things that things fall under. So something like she she does truly believe that she's ugly. Oh yeah, that one's come up. Attractive. Um, and and not good at a lot of things. So that kind of falls under not normal because she expects kids to be more attractive, expects them to be good at soccer. Huh. Okay, and um, what's the reality of things? How does, is, what's her level of attractiveness or athleticism, things like that, that she? I would say she's not, she's not that athletic, but she, she would be able to hold her own, I mean, with people who haven't played as much as she hasn't played. She's not particularly, you know, she's not too small to play the game, she'd be, you know, she, she would be able to get in there and do it. Um, attractive, it's hard to tell. Cause she does a lot of hiding oh. under stuff. Okay, Lots so her hair is like of... all over and she dresses in a way that keeps her hidden too. Very, yeah. So she makes herself invisible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh. She doesn't wear anything flashy, she doesn't. And that's in part because of grandma and her Aunt also don't let her wear anything flashy. Yes. Is that true? Yeah, that's also true. Okay. They don't like anything too provocative. Uh huh. Or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, because we've got a lot to cover, I'm not going to go for real long with this role play, but I'll try to go just long enough to draw some things out that we can then restructure. And um, we'll try to um, do some of these strategies. What's the evidence? Another what, alternative interpretation, 
see if something comes up, what if, what would I tell? Um, I'd probably say, what would I tell Alan or Carla? Um, and if there's an opportunity to come up with a behavioral experiment, we'll try that too. But I don't know if it's going to present itself since we're just doing this right now and there's no prep for it. So um, we'll see what happens. OK. Um, so I guess we'll start where I was thinking we would abbreviate things, but I think it's useful to just go ahead and show the structure and um, of the meeting. So I'll go ahead and do it. OK, so hey, Karen. How are you today? <coughs> I'm OK. Yeah? So on a 0 to 10 scale, about how irritable you're feeling, like we did last time from 0 to not at all to 10, you're just ready to explode. Where are you at today? Probably a 4. Oh, OK. That's good. So 4 is OK? Mm -hmm. And that's where you left last time. Yeah. It was about a 4. And um, over the course of the week since we last met, did anything come up that caused your anger to go up any higher than that? My aunt said we were going to go to dinner um, because I actually did OK on something in school. Uh huh. And then she called and said we couldn't go. Mm. So another disappointment, another time when somebody tells you something that gets you excited and then they take it away from you. OK. So I was thinking today um, that I would like to talk about um, oh, just some of the things that we had mentioned last time we met that were, seemed really important, like the, your thoughts about yourself, thoughts about your aunt and your grandmother, um, thoughts about other kids. I was hoping we would spend time talking about that. And it sounds like, um, would you like to add to our agenda talking about um, this situation where your aunt promised you a reward and then took it away? Mm -hmm. OK. So we'll add that to our agenda, too. Anything else that you would like to bring up today and be sure that we talk about? Well, I talked to that girl at the lockers. Oh, good. So you did your homework. Yeah. Excellent. So I said something to her, and she said something back, and then she quit talking to me. Uh-huh. OK. So that sounds like a really um, important thing for us to talk about. Because I can tell from the way that you said that, that you had a lot of thoughts about um, why she stopped talking to you. So I think that would be really good to talk about. Um, all right, so we've talked about um, our home, the homework. And we've set a kind of an agenda for what we're going to talk about. Um, let's just kind of check in on what do you remember from the last time we met? What do you think were the important things that we talked about? Last time we talked about if I changed the way that I thought about myself, that I might feel better mm -hmm. and probably do more things or try to talk to people. Mm, maybe my aunt wasn't trying to be mean to me. Wow, great. Those are really good things. I'm really glad that you remembered those. Excellent. You're doing a great job in our meetings. I'm really impressed. You know, when we first met, you were a little hesitant to talk about things, and you've been doing a great job of talking about things. And that's been really helpful. And, um, now you're even thinking about what we talk about between meetings and remembering it. That's really helpful, too. So if we keep um, working together like this, I think we'll be able to really make some good changes and help you to feel better in general and help you to think more positively about yourself. And that'll help you feel better, too. Great. So. Of our list of things that we have on our agenda to talk about, where would you like to start? Do you want to start with um, the conversation you had, short one, at the locker? Do you want to talk about 
your aunt taking away your reward? Or do you want to talk about um, those thoughts you have about yourself? Where would you like to start? I'd like to talk about my friend at the locker. Great. So do you want to just go ahead and give me a picture of what was going on? It was, in B, it was right after lunch and we had to get books to go into class. And I thought this is a good time because she was standing right there and going to her locker. And I went up to her and she, I said, hey, what's going on? And she said, not much. Uh-huh. So when she said that, um, not much, did she say it like, hey, not much? Or did she say it more like, not much? Or, you know, what was the kind of impression that you got from the way that she said it? How did she say it? Mm. She was cool. She was like, not much. Oh, okay. All right. So she said, uh, not much. Yeah. And then um, that was the end of the conversation? Yeah, so then I waited for her to say something else, and she didn't say anything. Uh-huh. And so then I thought, she's probably making fun of me. Ah. Uh. And so then I just closed my locker, and I walked. Wow. So I bet that you felt kind of embarrassed and really bad again about that. She didn't that. say anything after that. Yeah. And because it wasn't just that she didn't say anything, it was because you ended up thinking to yourself, Oh, I bet she's making fun of me in her head. Huh. So, what are some other things or other reasons why she might not have said anything more? She hates me. Okay. So you could come to the conclusion that she hates you. And, um, you know, we can talk more about the evidence for and against that thought, but let's just stick with, for now, coming up with other ideas for why she might not have said anything to you. She thinks I'm ugly. Mm. Wow. So one of the things that I can tell right now is that when these things happen, you're really sensitive to them and it just wakes up all of these negative thoughts about yourself and all those beliefs and it seems like you really believe those things too. Yeah, I can understand then why it's so hard for you to meet other people and why you'd feel down so much of the time if you believe those things. If she liked me, she would have said something else. Hmm. Now, in order to like you, doesn't she have to know you? I don't know. She, I think if you, I remember correctly, the two of you have only exchanged kind of like, hey, hey, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is that really enough time for her to get to know you? I don't know. Hmm. Would you say you know her? I know her name. Uh-huh. So maybe she knows your name. Now, in order to really hate somebody, which you were thinking she might hate you, don't you have to know the person? And wouldn't the person have to do some really horrible, mean things to you for you to hate the person? Not if they're ugly. I hear people saying that they hate someone because they're ugly. Oh, I see. So you're basing your thought that she doesn't like you, that she hates you, on reading her mind and coming to the conclusion that she thinks you're ugly. It's true. Hmm. So that's something that you believe somehow, that you're unattractive. But we don't know whether she thinks that. Do we? No. OK. But why else? I think you've told me some things about her that might explain why she didn't say more than um, what she said and why she might have stopped talking. So why else might she have um, not talked anymore or not taken the conversation further? People make fun of her all the time. Oh, okay. So what might she have been thinking if other people make fun of her? 
she's probably not used to having a lot of conversations either. Yeah. And maybe she was even thinking, hey, I don't know this person. I bet she's making fun of me in her head. Maybe. Maybe. And if she thought that, then she's likely to not say anything else. Mm -hmm. Huh. So that's a possibility. What else might she have been thinking that led her to not say anything else? Maybe she didn't know what to say. Hmm. Maybe. And maybe she didn't know what to say and she was afraid, oh no, what if I say the wrong thing? This is a person that's been nice to me. I might say the wrong thing and then I'll blow it. So she says nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you thought to yourself, oh, maybe she didn't talk to me because she was afraid she was going to say the wrong thing or she didn't know what to say, or that, wow, this is a person who other people have made fun of, and so she's just being cautious and she's not saying anything. Would that have made you feel so bad? If she was just being shy? Uh-huh. No. Hmm. And from what you've told me about her, you know, you've mentioned that she's a little bit different from the other kids, that she doesn't really seem to hang out with any other kids. And um, so do you think that there's, how much do you believe that she really was just being shy? I believe a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, what would be other evidence in the future that she's just kind of shy? How would you know that? I could watch to see how she acts to other people. Mm -hmm. OK. I think that's a really good idea. And we can watch and see if she acts in that kind of withdrawn, shy way, not talking much with other people. And seems like she's maybe even a little bit embarrassed when she talks to people. Mm -hmm. That would be good to do. If you thought to yourself, hey, she's just shy, would you be more likely to try talking to her again than if you thought, eh, she's making fun of me? No, she'd probably like it if I talked to her. Mm -hmm. it'd probably make her feel better. Yeah. Huh. So, do you like to make other people feel better? Sure. Makes you feel good. So if you do that and you talk to others and you, at the core of who you are, like to make other people feel good, then what does that tell us about you? I'm nice. Hmm. What else does it tell us about you? I'm, I'm a good person. Huh. So being nice, being a good person, talking to other people, developing a friendship, sounds kind of normal. Is that possible? Probably not. Hmm. A little bit too big of a leap right now, huh? To believe that that's a possibility. She's not normal either, though. Uh-huh. OK. Huh. Well, that's an interesting way to look at it. But to me, that says, wow. Karen's a really nice kid because she's willing to take the risk in front of the other kids that don't like, what's the girl's name? Carrie. 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 Um, to befriend somebody who other kids make fun of and who aren't, they're not nice to. To me, that just says you're really a nice person, that you're willing to do that. And also that you're kind of brave to do it too. Hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know. Something to think about. So, we, um, it, when you initially, when you thought to yourself that she didn't um, talk to you, it was because you thought she was making fun of you. So, um, do you know what we call that when you're putting thoughts into other people's heads? You said I was reading her mind? Yeah, so it's mind reading. Are you very good at that? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So you do it a lot? Well, sometimes, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sometimes it's pretty obvious what people are thinking. Really? Wow. How good are you? Good. Like, w can you, you know, the obvious one would be, I do, what do you think I'm thinking? But I'm not going to do that one. Um, so you, um, so you take, um, you really believe that you're pretty good at it, and so you believe the thoughts that you end up thinking other people think. And let's say how you, and it sounds to me like you really believed what you thought Carrie was thinking. So um, if it's true that you're a really good mind reader and that you're accurate in your reading of other people's minds, then, if you talk to Carrie again, or if you ever get to know Carrie, she should say that, hey, remember that time when you said hey to me at the locker? I was making fun of you in my head. And so we should be able to find that out. But if it turns out that Carrie was just really shy, and she was thinking, oh, I don't think she could like me. Nobody does. Then what does that tell us about your ability as a mind reader? I want to change my answer then. I think she was just shy. Oh, OK. So that's um, a real possibility that you know she was just shy. I think that's what she's going to say. Uh-huh. Good. Um, but originally, when you were reading her mind, you thought the opposite. So I think in the f if you do get to know Carrie, we'll do an experiment. And we'll see what she was actually thinking at the time, and what she thinks a lot of the time. I wonder if you two, in some ways, think alike. You know? Because you've mentioned that when you start talking to people, you think that they think, oh, she's ugly. She's, um, I hate her. And um, a lot of negative things like that. And that causes you to not end up getting to know people. Kind of keeps you away from people. So um, do you want to talk some more about that situation? Or do you want to move on to one of the other things in our agenda? What do you think? I think we should move on. OK. So before we move on, let's just kind of summarize what we've learned so far. And that is one of the things that I've learned is that when um, you talk to someone and they don't real clearly show you that they wanted to keep talking with you and that they really like you, you jump to the conclusion that they must hate you and they must think you're ugly. And then that leads you to feel bad and not want to really be around the person. Mm -hmm. But as when we talked about it and we looked at other ways that, um, of thinking about it, we ended up finding out maybe Carrie was just shy. And it wasn't a matter of her thinking all those kind of mean things about me. And when you thought that maybe she was just shy, you ended up, um, you wouldn't have felt as bad about it. OK, so what are on our um, list of other things to talk about would you like to talk about next? <laughs> you want to talk about the situation with your aunt? Or, yeah? Yeah. OK. So can you tell me more about that? She said that if I got an A on my test, that she would take me out to get Japanese food. Uh-huh. Um, and 
I was really excited about it, and I thought Alan might go too. Wow. And it was supposed to be on Wednesday night, and then Wednesday came around, and my grandma said, you know, your aunt's not going to be able to go tonight because she has to work. And I said, no, she made the plan. She said that we could go, and my grandma kept saying, no, she has to work. And then she never even called me. Wow. So it was really disappointing. Yeah. And it felt like you were betrayed again. Mm-hmm, because it was like 5 o'clock and she didn't call, and then it was 6 o'clock and she didn't call. And what does your aunt do for work? She does graphic design. Uh-huh. And um, do you know anything about what that's like, what her job's like or anything? Okay. So we don't really know if she's at work, if she can make um, personal calls. Like at some jobs, they don't allow people to make personal calls. They have, they're at work, they're supposed to do work. But I don't know. You know, I'm not sure with your aunt whether that's the case or not. But I get it. You felt betrayed again, and you've had so many betrayals in your life that just is, it just seemed like here's another one of those. Nobody ever sticks to their promise. Mm -hmm. And here I worked so hard. I got an A. That's what my aunt and grandma have wanted is for me to get good grades. Yeah. And then they don't even come through with the reward that was promised. Mm -hmm. So you thought when your aunt, um, when you heard from your grandma that your aunt couldn't take you out, you thought what? She doesn't care. She doesn't care. Maybe she's not even at work and she just forgot. Wow. And um, if she didn't care, what would that mean? Or what does that mean about you? That I don't matter. Mm -hmm. So when people disappoint you, you come to the conclusion that I just don't matter. It's kind of like back to I'm invisible. Mm -hmm. I don't exist. Yeah. I see. So a disappointment quickly leads to confirmation of I'm invisible, I don't exist, I don't matter. And then I said to my grandma, well, fine, I'm not going to eat dinner here either. Uh huh. And I went upstairs, and she never even came up to find out how I was doing. Wow. She didn't, she didn't ask anything. I just uh -huh. didn't even eat dinner. Uh-huh. So you must have thought then, tell me, I'm, jump, I'm doing a little mind reading here. Um, did you jump to the conclusion then that uh, grandma didn't care either? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. And then that just led you to feel even worse. Mm -hmm. I get it. So let's check on something. You said, um, you know, maybe your aunt just really doesn't care, and maybe she really wasn't even at work. So what night of the week was that? Wednesday. Wednesday night. And your aunt works what days of the week? I mean, most people work Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was a weeknight when she normally works. Well, sometimes she does work on Wednesday at dinner time. Okay. What are her typical work hours? It depends. Most of the time she gets off at 6 or 7 at night, but sometimes she has to stay till 8 or 9 because Alan complains about that. Oh, uh, okay. So it's possible then that she could have actually been working. Mm-hmm, because sometimes she's supposed to pick him up at football, and uh -huh. she can't come until really late. Oh, I see. And so it's not a matter of she's just being neglectful or doesn't care or doesn't even recognize that somebody exists. It's a matter of her work won't let her go. Mm -hmm. She has to stay. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. She should have called. Uh-huh. So it would have been the, the polite thing, the right thing to do would have been to have called and said, hey, I'm really sorry. Um, I can't make it tonight. But she didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And that's possible that she's just not um, thoughtful in that way. And it's also possible that um, maybe um, 
she was at work and trying to rush her way through it so she could get home. She thought, hey, I'll talk with Karen when I get home. Is that possible? The phone rang later on that night, but I don't know if it was her. Oh. So it could have even been her that called later and was say, wanted to say, hey, I'm really sorry about that. But we don't know for sure. Don't know. Yeah. So um, today is, that was Wednesday. Today is Thursday. Thursday. So that was just last night. Mm -hmm. So have you gotten a chance to talk with your aunt and find out what happened? No. Okay. So we don't really know if it was because she just doesn't care or whether she got called in to work. Don't know. Uh-huh. So let's say that um, we were going to test your thought that she just didn't really care, I'm invisible, I'm worthless in her eyes. Then if you asked her about last night, what would she say? If she really didn't care, she'd probably just tell me what she was doing because she doesn't care. Like, what do you mean, what would that be, be like? And say? I wasn't working. I just didn't feel like coming and getting you. OK. All right. So that's a evidence that she really didn't care. Mm -hmm. OK. And so what would be evidence that she really did care? If she said she was sorry. Uh-huh. That she missed dinner. OK. Is she a person who apologizes, or is she kind of tough and doesn't apologize? I hear her apologize sometimes to Alan. OK. So it's possible. Mm -hmm. And um, what if she just says to you, hey, I really had to work late last night. We could go out to celebrate another night. How would that be? Would that be evidence that she cares or evidence she doesn't care? That she cares. OK. So let's say that you're going to have this conversation with your aunt. And I'll be your aunt. OK? Um, how would you ask and when would you ask? So tell me first, when would you ask? When I see her. OK, so like, is that when? you get home tonight, or is that when she gets home from work, or when would it be? She stops by my grandma's house every night. OK. Not every night, but she probably will tonight. All right. Any reason why she'll stop by tonight more than any See other? If grandma needs anything. OK. All right, so she stops by the house. Mm -hmm. And then what would you say to her? I'd say, why didn't you pick me up last night? Oh, OK. So if I'm your aunt, and um, I walk in the, in the door, and um, I hear an accusation. Why didn't you pick me up last night? That might make me a little defensive. And I might get a little grumpy. I might not be nice, very nice in the answer I gave you. So what would happen if you were to say to her, um, what's her name? My aunt is um, Anna. Anna. What if you said, hey, Aunt Anna, I really missed you last night. I missed going out for dinner. I was really looking forward to because I worked hard for that A. What happened? She'd probably tell me she had to work. OK. And if that was accurate? That's OK. OK. I'd, maybe I'd say maybe we could go. Friday night, because then Alan can go too, because he doesn't have football practice. Wow. I think that's a great su suggestion. And I really like the way that you said that too. If you'd say to her, hey, maybe we could go Friday night. It'd be really fun. And then Alan could come along too. I'd really like that. Then she might do it. I think that's a really good way of handling it. And then what would the evidence support? Would it support, I'm invisible, she doesn't care? Or would it support that she really does care? And it depends on if she does it or not. If we go mm -hmm. on Friday the, and she remembers, because sometimes she doesn't remember.
Mm-hmm. If she remembers and we do it, then that's good. Uh, so she has a little bit of a memory problem, too. She says she's busy. Uh-huh. And you jump to the conclusion she's not busy, she just doesn't care. Sometimes she just doesn't remember. Uh-huh. So sometimes she just spaces things out. She's just not doing it on purpose. It's just chance she spaces it out. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. So let's say that um, you're a little concerned that she's going to forget to go out tomorrow night. What could you do to increase the chances that she'll remember? I could call Aunt Alan and tell him to remind her on Friday when she picks him up from school. Okay, that's a great idea. So what happens, what would you do if um, she actually had to work late? Then what, how could you handle that? What could we do? Like, um, I was thinking maybe you could talk with her about, hey, if you have to work late, could we go out after work? Could we maybe just go someplace and have dessert together? Or um, could we go somewhere and have a quick bite to eat and then let Alan and I hang out? That would work because she lets us stay up late on the weekends when I go mm -hmm. over there. Good. So um, that might be a strategy for getting what you want. And um, so we should probably talk at some time about problem solving. Sounds like you had a, a problem, and that was um, that your aunt sometimes spaces things out. And then we thought about possible solutions to that problem. And we came up with a pretty good one. And um, hopefully, it'll lead to success. And we'll see if it did or didn't, mm -hmm. OK? So um, I think we're running kind of long, time-wise. So let's take a stop right there for right now. Mm -hmm.